But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for a father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. I was always warned never to take your uh, seminary binders into the pulpit. I have violated that this morning. I have two pieces out of a seminary binder, so you need to pray because I have violated the instructions of my seminary professors at this point, but we won't talk about that, right? Right now, I'd like you just to pray quietly where you're at, that God would open your hearts to receive the word through the power of his spirit. Uh, one of the things we're looking at this morning is spiritual baptism. We're going to understand that that's a, that's a one-time permanent thing. But there's also the empowerment of the Spirit of God through the, to the preaching of his word and to the reception of his word. So there's, there's also what we call unction. There's also a time when God equips us with the Spirit to do certain things. And we beg him for that. I want you to do that right now. I want you to beg God that he would give me his Spirit for the preaching of the word. And that be, you're begging God to open your hearts to receive that word by his power of his Spirit right now. Would you do that please? Father God, I thank you for the prayers of your people. As we come before you this morning, Father, we ask that you would close out the cares and concerns of the world, that you would help us to focus upon Christ, our Savior, your Son, the one whom you sent, for this is eternal life, to know you, the one true living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Father, help us to know Christ more and more every day. Help us to know him more now. Help us to understand, Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand the text that is before us, Father. And that which came to announce, to herald, the king is coming. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that is still the case, Father. We still live in that time. So please, Father, forgive us our sins this morning. As we come, we thank you that you've taken us out of this domain of darkness. And you've placed us into the kingdom of your beloved son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Oh, Father, please pardon us our sins right this moment, right now. Please, Father, would you do that for us? And would you, Father, please attend to this time, attend to the time of the preaching of your word, that I would be a servant of Christ and a steward of your mysteries. Please, Father, I need your assistance in this. There is much to be said. And, Father, so I ask that you would lead and guide and instruct us now. Lord, you would teach us and that you would write your word upon our hearts, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ more and more every single day, Father. Make that so. And may this also, though, Lord, in that be for your glory and for the good of your people as they have gathered to worship you. So please, would you bless our time, Father, for your, again, for your glory and for our good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the section in Matthew, I want to back up just a little bit and give you just a little bit of review. One of the things that we didn't have time for last week, in verse 5 it says, Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. This was a baptism of preparation. It was a baptism of confession of sins. One of the things you need to understand is that the Jewish people were never baptized. They never would never get baptized. You have to understand something about what this says in the, in, the, in the culture, in the time of what's going on here. This would have been something that would have attracted everybody's attention. 
especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who would have thought our religious and our political position is being threatened right now. Whatever John the Baptist is doing out in the wilderness, this is a threat. That's the way a Pharisee and a Sadducee would have seen this. And John draws our attention to this. I mean, Matthew draws our attention to this, that what was happening in the wilderness was drawing the attention of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But why would this be the case? You know, we need to understand something about the baptism of the time. What this would have been was a baptism for the proselytes. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to worship Yahweh and become a Jew, you would get baptized. Your family, your whole entire family would more than likely be involved. But what happened was as you go through Levitical washings, you do this yourself. And then there would be a sacrifice, and there would be other, some other, a couple other things that they would do to initiate this. But the baptism that is sp- spoken of here is for those who are outside of the kingdom of God. Those who are outside of the promises of Abraham who want to come into it. And therefore, being baptized would have meant that you were outside wanting in, and this is what you had to do. Now, did you notice who showed up? Everyone from Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding districts, it was all Jews. Who formed the first church? Was it Gentile or Jews? The first 20,000 were Jews. Understand that these people are coming and they're confessing their sins, something the Pharisees and Sadducees would never do. Read the Gospel of John in chapter 8 where Jesus is talking to them and they're like, we don't need to, we're not in bondage. He's arguing that they're in bondage, that they need to deal about their sins, right? No, our father is Abraham. He says, no, if your father were Abraham, you'd do the deeds of Abraham. Your father is the devil. That's pretty, whew. That's a, that's a good evangelism tool, by the way. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. But when they come out to be baptized, they're basically saying, the people, all these Jews are coming saying, we're outside of the kingdom of heaven. We're outside of the promises of Abraham. We're outside and we want in. We want to confess our sins. We want to be prepared for when the king comes. That's what's going on here, and it's all of Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding district. All the Jews have come out for this. The Sadducees show up because they're like, what's going on? Wait a minute. What are they doing? How are our, the people that we've been kind of taking advantage of, right? Sadducees would have been over the temple. They would have been the ones that you would have come to and you would have dealt with on a financial basis. Okay, the Sadducees were a group of, of leaders who basically thought you get all you get now because there's no afterlife. Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. So when Jesus goes in on those Passover times where he's cleaning out the temple, he dealt with the Sadducees. What did they think of him when he did that? They didn't like that, did they? You're messing up our economy. He flips the tables and says, my house is a house of prayer. You're making it a robber's den. He would have insulted the Sadducees. He does that twice, by the way, if you ever wondered about that. He does it at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. He doesn't just let it happen or just doesn't go in and make a point of it once, but twice he does that. So the Sadducees were those who didn't believe in a resurrection. They only believed in the first five books of the the Torah, of of the law. And that's the only thing that they believed in. And so when Jesus confronts them, he actually goes into that to prove to them that there is a resurrection. So he goes and plays on their playing field and says, no, you missed the point. Pharisees, they were the ones who controlled the synagogue. So they had the heart of the people. Much more numerous were the Pharisees. And they're the ones who dealt with the, 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 the synagogue, the, the weekly sacrifices, the weekly meetings together. And they would do what? They would add to the law. They would say, we're going to make it so that we can withhold the law by adding to it and keep the law. How many of you can keep the law? But the Pharisees were teaching that you couldn't. So they added to it. And they also believed in oral tradition. So with the, uh, I just got back from Utah and I tried to promise my elders I wouldn't mention this, but they believe in oral tradition too. They believe that there's an oral communication, just like the Catholic Church, when the Pope sits upon his throne, ex cathedra, and he speaks forth, he's speaking for God. Pharisees would have believed in a similar thing, that oral tradition was a part of what they understood, not just the scriptures, but we're adding to them, we're going to make sure we keep the law. And this would have been the Pharisees. Now, these two didn't get along at all. It's got the liberals and the conservatives, right? If you want to look at it as a political thing, they don't get along. But when John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and everybody's going to him, they show up, okay? That's why they're showing up because all of the Jews are basically saying, we're outside of the promises of Abraham and we want to get in. How do we do it? And they've come to John and he says, you need to repent of your sins. You need to acknowledge them. You need to think rightly about your sins before God. You need to have a sorrow in that. And then you need to have a volition where you turn to God. You need to understand these things. And so you don't see that articulated by John the Baptist. 
But those are the elements that are there. And so all of Jerusalem had gone out to him, confessing their sins and being baptized. And so when we get to verse 7, this is the, this is the issue that is going on there. And Matthew draws our attention to this. Again, Matthew is drawing our attention to the herald because there's a king coming. There is a king coming. And so he wants to make sure that we understand that before a king comes, there would be a herald, John the Baptist. In verse 7 he says, But when they saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, they weren't coming out, they were coming to the baptism. So there's a little bit of a wordplay there. He said to them, You brood of vipers. How many of you have been welcomed like that? You brood of vipers, you family of vipers, is what he's basically saying. You belong to a family of serpents, venomous, poisonous individuals. That's who you belong to. It's just like saying your your father is the devil, okay? It says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's important for us to understand here, because when the king comes, not only does the king bring salvation, but he also brings judgment, Now, in some regards, these are going to be separate, but there is judgment that is on the world right now. There are things that happen in our world today. If you just run across the street, what will happen to you if cars are coming? There are consequences, but there's also things that are forms of judgment on our world right now. There will be a wrath to come, though. So I believe that John is talking about something yet to come, a judgment yet to come in the future. And he says, who warned you from this? The picture of here of vipers is just like if you started a grass fire. Snakes like to hide out in the long grass. And if you started a grass fire, it goes really quickly. And the snakes would then wake up and run. This is the picture that he's painting here, is that you see something burning and you're afraid of it. You want fire insurance. How many of you, when you came to the Lord, were doing it because you wanted fire insurance? Because you knew there was a wrath to come. But did you have true repentance? Did you buy fire insurance? They're looking for fire insurance. Something's going on. People are coming to be baptized, and they want to know what it is. They're looking for fire insurance. In the book of Acts, when Paul gathers up, he's on the island of Malta, and he gathers up some sticks. It would have been a picture of that. There was a lot of snakes that just remained silent, and they looked like a stick. And he would have gathered up a bunch of sticks, and he, would have, he threw them into the fire, and one latched onto him. And all the men of Malta were looking at him going, He threw it off into the fire, and they're waiting for him to swell up and die. And that's the picture that John is painting here that does. A very venomous people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, are very venomous. They're evil. They're very evil. They're a family of evil vipers. He says, who warned you from the wrath to come? Who warned you to come out here into the wilderness and flee that, those things? And so that's the picture that he paints for him. And Matthew will use that again. John, uh, Jesus will use that example of them many, many times as well. And then he says, Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Those stones are the Gentiles. He says, If the people of God won't come to God... Even God can raise up Gentiles to worship him. He can bring who believes in him to faith. He can bring us. Most of us sitting here are Gentiles, that God has changed our heart. Like in Ezekiel, he's taken your heart of stone away. Did you come here today thinking, God has taken my heart of stone away and given me a heart of flesh? Are you thankful for that? Have you thought about that? God has done heart surgery on you. How many of you were able to do heart surgery on yourselves? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? No. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What does that mean? What does it mean to bear fruit in keeping with repentance? How many of you have fruit keeping with repentance this morning? How many of you brought your fruit in to share with everyone? How many of you have a garden at home? He's using agricultural terms, which is great. Fruit. What is fruit of repentance? Is there, is there, on your your fruit trees, is there just fruit one time in the season, once a year, that's it? But the next year, there's fruit again, right? There's fruit of repentance. So there's a continuation. There's a continuation. We don't just repent once. We continually keep on repenting. That's what he's talking about. John is talking about a fruit of repentance, something that we continue to do again and again because we sin and we go and we feel remorse. We rightly understand it and we ask for forgiveness and we repent of these things. But what does it mean to repent of our sins Did anyone respond? It doesn't show that the Pharisees or the Sadducees responded. Turn with me really quick to Luke. In Luke, we see people in this crowd, 
In this crowd, we see people who say, what do we need to do? Have you come here this morning saying, what do we need to do? What does it look like to have the fruit of repentance? We're thankful for the the account given in Luke chapter 3 and verse 10 because people ask the question, what do we need to do? And so John gives them an example of the fruit of repentance. And the crowds were questioning him saying, then what shall we do? Because he said that, that those who do not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And John responds to them. And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, come, collect no more, sorry, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Are we content with our wages? Are these things that we can model in our lives as well? Do we give to the poor? Do we say, I have an abundance. How do I now share this with those around me? Am I content with my wages? That's a big one for me. Am I content with my wages? Am I content with what I have? Or I'm always thinking, wait, can I, is there a way to do this? How many of you play board games like Splendor, I think is one of those games, right? You're trying to collect things, right, and spend things. It's a strategy game. How many of you are uh, credit card junkies? Well, there's the points thing, right? I know there's some people in here that if you, if you get the card, you get the points, right? So you just have to figure out how you rightly use these cards to get the bonus points to fly for free. I fly for free, but it's no doing of my own. I have a credit card junkie that I'm married to, and it's great in that respect, right? And I am content with my wages. God has blessed me richly. But there's always that fun little game, right, that we play. So we have to always think, what is this fruit of righteousness? How am I better using the the kingdom resources? Do we think that way? My paycheck is kingdom resources. My paycheck that I get is a kingdom resource. How am I best stewarding my kingdom resources for the what? The king. For the kingdom. So that's what he's saying here. The fruit of repentance is this idea that you're kingdom-minded, that you're thinking, how do I rightly show what's inside me? Now, you're not trying to gain favor with God, right? No, it's not like the Boy Scouts where you get the merit badges and you get the Eagle Scout. Sorry for those of you here who are, anyway. That's not the case. What God has done inside causes you to think this way. What God has done within you, because he's put his spirit within you, causes you to think, how can I be kingdom-minded? How can I best use what you've given to me for the betterment of your kingdom, which will come? Your will will be done in heaven as it is on earth. I hope I got that right. But kingdom-minded... So he's telling them the fruit of repentance is a kingdom-mindedness. The fruit of repentance shows itself in our lives. And so we can look at our lives. We're supposed to look at our lives. We're supposed to look within us and say, is this transformation, has it happened? Do I pass the test? No. In 2 Corinthians 13, it says that we're supposed to take the test, but we don't pass the test. The spirit dwelling within us does that. Is there evidence of the Spirit within us showing that we are the children of God, that there is fruit in our life? He says even even though they're there, he can raise up children from these stones to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I believe he's speaking of an end judgment, of a final day judgment where God will judge the world through his son. Christ will come and he will judge. But he says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. I am not even capable of carrying his shoes, is what John is saying. I don't even have the the ability to carry his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Some people believe that this is the fire of the Holy Spirit and that all of this was taken, has taken place at the, the, the time of Pentecost 
in Acts chapter 2? I would say, no, there's something yet to come. One of these elements happened on the day of Pentecost because Jesus said, I am going to send the helper. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to send the helper. And he can't send the helper until I leave. He promised that to his disciples. He promised that to the church. That happened on the day of Pentecost because in Acts 1, 4, and 5, he says, wait. Wait for the promise. Wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, the difference in the Old and the New, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was on them, okay? On Saul until Saul did what? Saul violated what God had told him to do, and he took his spirit off of him, and then he placed an evil spirit on Saul. Judas had remorse, but he didn't have the Spirit of God. He didn't have the fruit of repentance. Now, though, we're given the Spirit. Now we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you were saved, when you came to Christ... You were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you became a part of a body of Christ. We are a body here today. For those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, on that day when you put your faith in Christ, when the gospel was made known to you, guess what happened? Well, previous to that, in my thinking, is that the Spirit of God was there, placed in you so that you understood the gospel, because you couldn't understand it otherwise. Just like in Ezekiel when it says, I'll take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, So you can understand the gospel. I'll put my spirit within you. That's what he's done. That was the promise to Israel in Ezekiel 36, 25. He said, I will put my spirit within you so that you rightly understand the gospel, so that you rightly understand the ordinances, so you rightly understand what it means to show the fruit of repentance in your lives. He says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. How many of you are holy here today? Did you wear your holy attire? Some people know where I'm going, right? Not because you've cleaned yourself up. It's because God's put his spirit within you. His spirit is holy. That's what makes you holy. Be holy as I am holy. What? Be holy as you are holy, God? Was Peter right or was he just a little bit weird? No, he was right because he understood that the spirit of God was within his people, making you holy, making you the temple of God, making you what you are. So we need to rightly understand that. So we're going to open up some, some of my... Seminary notes. You guys okay with this? Don't ever take your binder in the pulpit, men. I have violated the instructions. How does it come about? If I call you to repentance today, if I say, you need to repent, if you haven't repented yet and placed your faith in Christ, and I say to you, repent, is that possible on your own merit? Turn with me to 2 Timothy. How does that come about? Is it a pleading? Is it a reckoning? In in Ezekiel, you saw God making it very well known to the people of Israel that he was the one doing it. Didn't you see that? As you read through it, maybe you should read through it again. Read through Ezekiel 36, 22 to the 38, and notice how many times God says through Ezekiel, I want them to know that I'm doing this. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So they'll know that I am the Lord their God. They'll know that I'm doing it. Not by their will, but my will. Not for your namesake, but for my namesake. And in 2 Timothy 2, 24, he says, the Lord's bondservant must be, not, not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps, if perhaps, God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses, that's up here in our minds, that you may come to your senses and escape the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. Until God gave you a mind to understand your sin and what it meant to repent, we were lost. We were in captivity to the devil. We were blinded by Satan. None of us are more powerful than Satan. None of us. But God does that for us. He says, if perhaps he may do that for us. If perhaps... And I would say to you right now, if you haven't come to the Lord, plead with him that he would do that for you because he's already given you a sense of that in many regards. So what are we talking about? What is this, this spirit baptism? That's, that's the repentance that leads to our repentance must have a spiritual baptism. And how do we understand spiritual baptism as opposed to a regular baptism, a water baptism? Because John said he baptized with water, but the one who comes after him Christ would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What is this spiritual baptism? Is it a baptism later on? 
You come to faith in Christ, and then later on, you get another spiritual baptism. Is it two baptisms? Is it two indwellings of the Spirit? How many of you are looking at me like I'm a crazy charismatic? Sorry, I didn't mean to dig up issues. But some people believe that you get saved, and then you get the power of the Spirit later. I would say in the book of Acts, it talks about the unction of the Spirit. Those are times when God empowers us to evangelize. That's when God gives us the ability to see into his word, and he leads us and he guides us, and the Holy Spirit is functioning in our lives. Here we're talking about a spiritual baptism. John is talking about one who will come after him, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Because we talk about unity. How many of you like being unified to the brothers and sisters next to you? How many of you sat next to somebody you like? How many of you sat next to somebody you don't like? Nobody wants to raise their hand, right? What does it mean to be in the body of Christ? What does it mean to be in the family of God? It means I don't like everybody here, but I love everybody here. Is that what it means? How many of you like the Thanksgiving table? <laughs> How many of you like to go to funerals with the family? It's like these are kind of just earthly examples of how are we bound together? How is it that we are unified? What unifies the church? What unifies us? In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, for by one spirit you were all baptized into one body. That's what unifies us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what John is talking about. This is what John the Baptist is talking about. Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to pour on you the Spirit of God who will not only be on you but in you. That's what Christ is going to do. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, For by one spirit you are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Notice the key word there, all and all. We were all baptized into one body, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon us, indwelt us, made us unified in this baptism. Sometimes we look at Romans 6, 3, 4, and 5, and we think, is that a spiritual baptism or is that a water baptism? In Romans 6, the, the jury is a little bit out. Douglas Moo doesn't believe so, but Martin Lloyd-Jones believes it is. I would have to say it is. If it's a salvation issue, if it's a conversion initiation, it is a spiritual baptism. That's what we see happening there. Turn with me also to Titus 3, 5. Let's look again at the work of the Spirit here. In Titus 3, 5, he says, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds. Thank goodness for that. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness. But wait a minute, Pastor. I thought you said we have to have the fruit of repentance. Absolutely. But he didn't save us on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. This is Titus 3, 5. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When you were saved, God put his spirit within you, empowered you to do the things that you do, empowered you to do the works of righteousness. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. How many of you want to do the works of the world that, are, that seem like sorrowful? Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 2.10. He says, don't do the, the, the sorrowful works. Do the works of righteousness. Find the works of righteousness of God. So the result of the spiritual baptism was what Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, the koinonia of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Be with you all. May the fellowship of the Spirit be with us all that we have been done. And this is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, 23 through 37. But it's also spoken of in Isaiah 40, 44, 3. Don't try and write all these down. I'll give you them later. In Isaiah 44, 3, it says, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Also in Joel 2, 28 and 29, it says, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is the promise that Jesus made in John 14, 16, 17, and 18. He said, I will ask the Father, this is John 14, 16, 17, and 18, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever, that is the spirit of truth 
whom the world cannot receive. This is what Paul talks about again in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. Old Testament, on them. New Testament, in you. Making you the body of the church. Making you the body and bride of Christ. Making you to understand what it means to have redemption. To have the fruits of righteousness. To understand what it means to have faith in Christ. What it means to have a sorrow and an understanding of our sins and to repent of them. And he goes on to say, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Wow. I will come to you. He will not leave us as orphans. He will come to us. He will be with us. He will abide with us till the end of the age. How many of you are thankful for these things? Think about this. Do you know the Spirit? Remember the song? Do you know the Spirit that's in you? Are you aware of the fact of what God has done in you? God has put His Spirit within us. We're unified by that, we're baptized in the Spirit so that we can do the works which he's given us to do. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? The works which he prepared beforehand. First he did that, and now the works come from it. The fruit comes from the tree. You don't get it the other way around, do you? The fruit doesn't make the tree. What the tree is, the fruit displays. What you are in Christ, the fruit of your life displays. What we are in Christ is displayed in our lives. What we do when we leave this building is a display of what Christ has done in you. John is talking about that. John is saying, give proof that the confession of your sins is real. Because later on in Jesus' ministry, a lot of people are going to leave him. A lot of people are going to walk away. You read John 6 when he says, you got to eat my body and drink my blood, they leave. What does he say to Peter? You want to leave too? He says, where am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Is that not true for us? Where are we going to go, Lord? There's not two products on the shelf. Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Oh, Christ, you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? Nowhere. What do you want us to do? Use this redeemed life in any way you choose. Use this life in any way you choose. His winning wind fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn. Oh, you're the wheat. You're the wheat. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There is a judgment to come. There is a judgment to come. I'm not selling you fire insurance, but there is a sobering thought for us today that people watch you. They want to see the fruit of repentance. They want to see that we truly walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. I'm not telling you that you had to wear a tie in here this morning, but I'm telling you that the world watches us. The world watches you to see if what is true in your life, of what you confess, is true in your life as you display it. Is there the fruit of repentance? Is it there? Is it obvious that you've confessed of your sins and that you continue to confess and repent of your sins? The Old Testament prophets, Jesus and John the Baptist, all promised that the Spirit would one day be poured out on God's people, put within God's people. This is called the promise of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, and the baptism with the Spirit. The promise was fulfilled at Pentecost, and now every Christian is the recipient of this incredible promise. We are recipients of that promise. I'm a Spirit-empowered preacher. I'm not crazy. I don't do the curly. But don't you get excited about being a child of God? Don't you get excited to wake up in the morning and go, and if my feet hit the floor and it's the morgue, I'm okay with that. It's okay. But if I get a breath, what do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? I'm yours. I belong to you. That's how Paul was content. Whether in rich or in poor, says, I have no, it doesn't matter. This is my paraphrase, sorry, I'm paraphrasing it. Because I'm in Christ, right? You get out of bed this morning going, I don't care what happens today, I'm in Christ. Who cares? It's all going to burn. We say that a lot, don't we? It's all going to burn. Then I go out and mow my lawn. I paint my house. And I fix things. 
but it's all going to burn, right? First Peter 3.10, Peter said, it's all going to be fire. It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to go away. You can go home and mow your lawn and not feel guilty. That's a fruit. Of, that's a fruit. That's fine. But does our, do our lives display that we are belong to Christ, that we're indwelt by the Spirit of God, and that the fruit on this tree, by the way, do you see trees eating their own fruit? The fruit is for everybody else, right? The fruit is for everybody else. If you've got two cloaks, give one to someone else. If you've got food, give it to someone else. The fruit, you don't eat yourself. It's for other people. So give out some fruit today to the people around you, to the people you encounter. Show yourself, oops, sorry. Show yourselves to have the fruits of repentance. 